Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. It's good to meet with you again. And before we go any further, I would just like to look at the bulletin and uh, make a few announcements here. I remind you that uh, next Sunday service will be posted, the Lord willing, uh, in time. And Pastor Marinas will be dealing with uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, and on the issue of favoritism in the church. So please take note of that. And uh, I just want to encourage you to continue to pray for the folk uh, under the prayer requests. Also, I need to mention uh, one birthday today, and that is Hitta Bachman's birthday. And Hitta, uh, the Lord's blessings, warmest blessings and grace and mercy for you on this wonderful day. We rejoice together with you and your family in the Lord's grace to you. Also, take note of the wedding anniversary today. Please wish Sandru and Angeline de Gavea on their wedding anniversary today. I think those were the most important things I needed to announce. Uh, I don't think there are any special prayer requests. So, let's come to the Lord and let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord, what a privilege it is to meet together, even though in this indirect way. It's wonderful to call upon your name together. And it is also wonderful, Lord, to hear from you and to consider your truth in your word. I pray that our time together would indeed be profitable spiritually as we consider the truth of your word. Please help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And what we're going to talk about is freedom and rights. Christian freedom and Christian rights. So I hope you're there and I'd like you to follow with me uh, from verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. Paul asks, am I not the free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And this is my defense to those who sit in judgment of me. Don't we have a right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do other apostles, and the Lord's brothers, and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier, who serves at a sol as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk. Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this is for us. Doesn't he? Yes. This was written for us, because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather 
than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul explained the limits of Christian freedoms, uh, freedom sorry, for us. And he dealt with it more or less uh, theoretically and uh, he established the principle if you like. And what should be the controlling factor when it comes to our freedom as believers? That's really the issue he was dealing with. Simply put, Christian freedom should be controlled by brotherly or sisterly love. It should be limited by a concern for the welfare of fellow Christians. And this is how Paul summarized this principle in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Our rights as believers end when another brother or sister is offended by our freedom. But now here in chapter 9, Paul goes a step further and he illustrates how he personally followed this principle in his own life. And the issue at hand was Paul's right to be financially supported by the people he was ministering to. In verses 1 to 14, he explains his right. Then in verses 15 to 18, he gives the reason why he personally would not demand this right. And in verses 19 to 27 of that chapter, he clarifies that he would in fact give up every right for the sake of winning people to Jesus Christ. Now in verses 1 to 14, Paul gives a few reasons for why he had the right to be supported by the churches he ministered to. And the first reason related only to apostles. But the others apply to every minister and every pastor and Christian worker at any time in the history of the church. And here comes the first reason Paul had a right that he mentioned, Paul had a right to be supported. He said he was or he is an apostle. Verses 1 to 6 again. Am I not free? He asks. Am I not an apostle? These are rhetorical questions, by the way. Have I not seen the Lord Jesus or Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Paul asks four rhetorical questions here in verse 1 alone. First one, am I not free? Now in their letter to Paul, the believers in Corinth must have made much of their own freedom in Christ. Something Paul must have taught them in the first place. But now he emphasizes his own freedom and rights. And it's like he's saying here, I have exactly the same freedom as you people. And I love my freedom as much as you do. But I love other things even more. Second question. Am I not an apostle? That is closely related to the first question. 
As an apostle, he would, if anything, have greater freedom than the average Christian. But Paul was always conscious of his apostleship. He did not preach or teach in his own name and in his own power. He was the Lord's apostle, the Lord sent one, commissioned to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And right here he verifies that he is indeed an apostle. One qualification for being a genuine apostle was that he needed to be an eyewitness of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So he asks, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? As we know from the Bible, Paul was not among the original disciples who were with Jesus during his earthly ministry, but he had seen the resurrected Christ on at least three occasions. The Lord appeared to Paul at his conversion, Acts chapter 9, and in two other visions that we know of, Acts 18 and Acts 22. Sorry, Acts 22. So Paul was a witness because he had personally met the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And the other proof of his apostleship was that believers in Corinth, it was them themselves. Verse 2, are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. The church at Corinth was one of the fruits of Paul's apostolic labours. Their saving faith and their knowledge of God's word came from Paul's faithful evangelism and discipling. And so the church in Corinth was in fact the seal, the authentic, authentication, the, the, authentic, the, the authenticating mark of his apostleship in the Lord. The church, or the Corinthian church, was the living proof, if you like, of Paul's genuineness as an apostle. Surely he had a right to be supported by them. And here comes the next question, verse 4. Don't we have a right to food and drink? That is, as a minister of Christ, not even to mention as an apostle, don't I have the right to expect that at least food and drink will be provided for me? And he continues. The fourth question. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other, the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? He's asking, don't I have the right to marry a Christian woman and have her minister with me wherever I go? The, the other apostles, that included Peter, Cephas, were married as were Jesus' brothers, the sons who were born naturally uh, to Joseph and Mary after Jesus. But Paul was single, probably a widower, as we know. And he also had the right, as did the other apostles, to take a wife with him as he ministered and also to have her supported along with him. Now, if you look carefully at this verse, I think this verse supports the principle that we should pay pastors and evangelists and missionaries and other Christian workers enough. We should support them enough so that they can have more time with their spouses in the ministry. They should not have to take an extra job or their spouse should not have to take an extra job to pay their own way. No doubt, uh, one of the, uh, or the contributing causes of divorce among pastors and ministers today is that many of them are not able to spend enough time with their wives and families. Obviously, a wife with small children at home or with uh, 
other commitments, such commitments, is limited in the trip she can take. But the point is, when it is possible for her to go along, every effort should be made by the sponsoring group to pay for her. The local church should pay for her. It's a question of the right attitude. The attitude of generosity in supporting the Lord's full-time workers. But then, with a hint of sarcasm here, Paul asks, Is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? The truth is that Paul and Barnabas had as much right as the others had to get their livelihood from the ministry without having to work on the side. But they paid their own way. And note, they did not pay uh, their own way because they were obligated to do so. They did it voluntarily for the gospel's sake. We'll get back to that in a moment. Another reason Paul had to be supported was it is common practice. Verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? He uses three illustrations here from, from, from workers that need to be paid uh, that is customary among everybody. Soldiers don't fight, he mentioned soldiers, and they don't fight during the day and then work a civilian job at night just to eat and buy clothes and have a place to say. Soldiers don't serve at their own expense. They are given food and clothing and arms and lodging and whatever else they need to live and fight effectively. And that is Paul's point here. Farmers is another example. Don't plant a, they don't plant a vineyard or cultivate a crop for someone without being paid. They don't farm for free and then do other work to make a living. They eat the fruit that comes from their farming being paid either in money or they share in the crop. And it's the same with shepherds. They don't work for free either. They expect at least some of the milk of the flock in payment. The point? All these kinds of workers are paid for their work. It's the customary and rightful and expected thing to do. Why should this not be true for God's workers as well? Another reason Paul had the right to be supported is that it is in the law of Moses. Verses 8 to 11. Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely, he says, this is for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much? If we reap a material harvest from you? Now this principle of workers being paid for their work is not merely a human argument, like the illustrations Paul gave a moment ago. God's own law teaches the same thing. Don't muzzle an ox while it's shredding out the corn. That is a quote from Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. And it refers to the general practice in the law of Moses that oxen were to be allowed to eat while they worked. That was payment for their work. But the primary purpose even of this Old Testament quote had to do with human beings. 
And as Paul explains in verse 9 and verses 9 and 10, is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? People should earn their living from their labor. The plowman and the thresher should be able to work in the hope of sharing in the harvest. So Paul had every right to apply this principle to himself. If people working for other people should be paid for their labor, surely God's workers should also be paid for their work. If, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? You see, the only difference here is that in the Lord, service, in His service, material payment is given for spiritual work and not ordinary work. The Lord provides His own spiritual rewards, that is true. But his people should provide a material reward and provide it generously as unto him. And the Lord's servants deserve to be supported well. In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5 verse 17, Paul calls for double honour. There should be a double, there should not be a double standard here though. One that applies to preachers and missionaries and other Christian ministers that put them at a considerably lower level than the rest of the people who work in the secular world. We should pay them as generously and leave the stewardship of that money to them uh, just as we expect stewardship of our own money to be left to us. Now, obviously, we should give our money only to ministries that are publicly sound and responsible. And this is a serious issue. It's amazing how some absolutely, people who are absolutely focused on the wrong stuff, preaching the wrong message, of prosperity get away literally with murder almost when it comes to giving and money. No, a ministry must be biblical, biblically sound and responsible and then we should give to it. Every appeal made in the Lord's name does not deserve the support of the Lord's people. Take note of that. Being wise in our giving is part of our stewardship. But when we give to a servant who is worthy, we should give happily and generously and trustingly. And God's children should reflect their Heavenly Father's generosity. Hey? In 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 Paul says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So as individuals and as churches, Christians should give generously to the Lord's work and to the support of his servants. And they will be blessed. It is our Lord's will that we be generous to our pastors and our educational workers and our missionaries and our leaders who come to minister to us just like God has been to us immeasurably generous another reason for Paul's right to be supported was because others exercise this right verse 12 if others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Hey, The fourth reason for having a, a right to be supported was that the believers in Corinth apparently had always supported their pastors. And they were supporting pastors now 
probably Apollos and Peter. And as the church's founding pastor and apostle, Paul had more claim on their support than the others. But now we see this amazing thing. But he did not use this right. In spite of the many reasons he had to justify his right to be supported, Paul waived the right willingly. Verse 12. But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Now Paul used the present tense here. And he was indicating that throughout his ministry, he continued to bear uncomplainingly whatever was necessary to fulfill his work. His normal way of life was self-denial. He worked as a tent maker to pay his own way while he preached and taught. Paul could tell the Corinthian Christians the same thing he told the Ephesian Christians in Acts chapter 20 and verse 34. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. But now the big question is, why? Why did not Paul insist on his right? <coughs> Because paying his own way was one way of not being a hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Paul did not want new converts or potential converts ever to think that he was preaching the gospel out of selfish motives or for selfish motives or for money. He did not want anybody to think that he was in the ministry for the sake of money or an easy life. And that approach was especially significant for Paul's work because he, more than any other apostle, worked in virgin territory among the Gentiles. Not only the gospel message here, but the Old Testament background was completely new to the people he reached. And he didn't want that message to be clouded or distorted in any way. The other apostles worked among Jewish people and the Jewish people understood the idea, maybe more clearly, that the Lord's servants should be supported by his people. But the Gentiles had no idea about this. And likewise, in new ministries today, it's wise for those workers either to support themselves or to be supported by fellow Christians until a group of believers or a church plant is well established. Particularly in light of some preachers who make merchandise of the gospel. They sell the gospel. And Christian workers should be very careful not to give grounds for any accusation like that against them. Calling people to come to Christ and to give their money at the same time is offensive to say the least. Because the gospel is offered free of charge. You come freely to Jesus Christ. He paid the full price for your sin. And then to demand money, or even suggest that we need money, I think is a terrible offence. Not just to people and other Christians, but also to God. Fifthly, the fifth reason Paul gave here as a right for his support 
He said, it is the general pattern. Look there at verse 13. You don't know, or don't you know, that those who work at the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? The fifth reason for Paul's right to be supported by the churches he served was that it had been a general pattern since the founding of the priesthood in Israel. The priests who served at the altar were supported by the tithes and the crops and the animals from the people they ministered to. In fact, hundreds of years before the, the, the Aaronic priesthood was established, Abraham gave tithes to, to Melchizedek. He was called a priest of God Most High in Genesis chapter 14. So already there it was established. And because these people attend regularly to the service of God as a way of life, they need to be provided for. Last reason Paul mentions here. Jesus commanded it. Verse 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Paul had the right to ask for support because the Lord himself had ordained the principle. Both God's law and God's Son teach that his prophets and teachers and ministers should be paid for their work in the Lord. But note, yes, the Lord commands his people to offer support to those who minister to them, but he does not command those who minister to accept that support or ever to demand support for themselves. No. It's a command for the people of God to support those who minister to them. Paul clearly did not do that. Verse 15. In verse 15 he says it again. But I have not used any of these rights. He had the right, as much as anyone else, more so than most. But for the gospel's sake, for his brothers and sister in Christ's sakes, for love's sake, he gladly limited his freedom and right in this area. He willingly waived his right not to be an offence to anyone. Now you ask, well, how was Paul able to do this? Wasn't he burning the candle at both ends? Yes, he was. What motivated him? What gave him the strength to do this and to keep on doing this? And what will give you the strength and the resolve to put this principle into practice in your own life. This is how Don Carson puts it. Astounding grace that God the Son should choose to leave his Father's glory and refuse to clutch his dignity exploit his right and make himself a no one in our sight. All praise Christ and his astounding grace. All praise his name. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And Although we have spoken about the Apostle Paul and about Christian workers, all of us are called to your work, Lord. And this principle applies to all Christians. 
and it is so, Lord, so often we demand our rights to be heard, to be honoured, even to be paid. Forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to live like Jesus did and in a measure like the Apostle Paul did. That we would honour the Gospel, preach the Gospel in a way that would honour Jesus Christ, our glorious Father, through the Holy Spirit. Please, Lord Jesus.